now. And we are going to take it away with uh, the first paper, which is Lillian Lieber's paper. Uh, I think we've got Lillian, and uh, I'm going to ask Alex you. Alex and Roland. Alex and Roland are here as well. There's Alex, and I see Roland as well. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Nice to see all your smiling faces. I, uh, I really thought I could just lean back for a while because I thought we were second. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, 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 no. You go first. <laughs> you go first today. <laughs> So, uh, Mariana is on this one, so please take it away, my friend. We're ready to go. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming in. So, with, uh, with the paper led by uh, Lillian, today we talk about the coastal environments. So, and the fact that the coastal environments are actually undergoing anthropogenic changes, including the installation of man-made structures like uh, offshore wind energy turbines. So, basically, this is leading to new interactions between marine predators and the installations, and uh, there is some evidence that is started that is uh, stating that uh, these installations can uh, even generate new foraging opportunities. So the foraging strategies, uh, predators' foraging strategies may vary in response to physical changes in local conditions. So assessing how free-ranging animals adjust and uh, fine-tune their foraging movements in highly and complex dynamic environments is fundamental to understand how they might respond to anthropogenic change. So, but we actually have a double problem in the marine environment. So the first problem is about tracking the oceanographic features, for example, fronts and headies, because uh, um, important levels of predator aggregation can actually occur at very fine scale. So within a few uh, kilometers with the short, uh, within the short internal waves, um, approximately between 0 0.1 and uh, one kilometers and can actually play a major role between predator prey uh, inter Interactions. So in uh, uh, coastal regions, uh, even more local uh, turbulence, so between 10 and uh, 100 uh, meters, can actually um, um, lead basically to uh, upwelling and eddy vortices, uh, and so can provide the profit profitable foraging opportunities for predators. So the tidal environment is very dynamic, and the seabirds should be able basically to locate these physical cues uh, to, um, for, for prey, basically across uh, all these uh, um, uh, dynamic uh, uh, range. So, but here we got to the second problem. The second problem is basically that we do not know how seabirds associate with these highly uh, localized flow features to find their prey. And uh, um, strong hydrodynamic processes can actually determine the spatial distribution of small prey items. And seabirds might show affinity to areas that are characterized by these physical uh, properties. So here we basically need uh, technical innovations that can uh, link high resolution animal positions with dynamic uh, physical cues to understand where predators forage and why. So the outer sphere uh, use drone te uh, technology to track uh, individual movement metrics from uh, uh, surface feeders like turds and uh, underlying physical do you still hear me? I got a warning for the connection. Yeah, okay, okay. So, okay, so it was hypothesized that uh, turns may vary um, their foraging movement in response to localized um, uh, flow, uh, flow features and uh, uh, could serve as uh, um, these features, these physical features could serve as uh, foraging uh, cues. So this study brings together three different fields. We have ecology, engineer science, and the field of statistical ecology that is developing methods for the analysis of time series extracted from, uh, from movement data. So that's here. We have Ilian, Alex, uh, um, Alex and, uh, and Roland. And uh, with this study, we get to the tidal channels located in the Northern Highlands, where we actually have a tidal structure, uh, which is a surface piercing monopile, which is a three uh, meter diameters, which is fixed on the seabed. So Lillian has a, has a starting question or any of the, the co-authors. Can you tell us about the role of this monopile and uh, um, uh, how it contributes to the formation or the enhancement, basically, of these uh, surface flow, flow features. Yeah, so um, because the monopile um, 
like you were saying, it's surface piercing, but it also extends all the way down to the seabed. So any really strong currents rushing past it will then, you know, interact with the entire monopile and then really, you know, stir up the water column and create this sort of turbulence field we were looking at. And uh, we've also seen, you know, similar structures arising from just submerged islands and rocks as well in the tidal channel, but of course, you know, tidal energy being very topical at the moment, we, we focus most of our analysis on, on the monopile, but um, maybe Alex wants to give his physical oceanographic view on the, uh, <laughs> on the wake as well. But. well I mean, you, you do get these uh, turbulent features anywhere where you have a flow and even over a flat seabed, you have um, uh, surface uh, manifestations of the turbulence in, in the water. And the turbulence in the water is obviously then transporting material. Uh, it could be sediment from the seabed. It can be small uh, fish, other prey items, up to the uh, up to the surface. Um, if you make the surface rougher or you add other structures and obstacles, then it will generate more turbulence and hence mix and stir the water um, more. I mean, just to lead on from what uh, Lillian said, is that we. We did some previous work where we were looking at natural um, turbulent patches in the wake of underwater pinnacles or a, a, a rocky island, as well as uh, this uh, monopile structure. And we actually found that the terms much preferred foraging near the, uh, the monopile structure. Um, so I, it, it was their favorite spot. So when we were doing this more detailed study, we went back to that. Uh, that particular spot as well. Fantastic, thank you. So, okay, uh, so um, you mapped the, the, um, the turns, the trajectories, and uh, so the underlying uh, uh, surface velocity field um, in uh, synchrony using, uh, um, with uh, basically collected, you collected this data with the drones, and then uh, you mapped these, uh, uh, these variables using uh, uh, machine learning, and then you use this, this Covariates within a hidden Marco model uh, framework to quantify then the foraging associations with which are basically velocity, uh, magnitude, and uh, divergence. So I have a question that is again uh, an oceanographic question. Um, so is the extraction of this uh, um, of this physical feature and the methodology that you that you have used uh, is a common practice in uh, um, in oceanography? Uh, okay. <laughs> I already say yes, yeah, no. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the, the techniques we were applying have been applied for measuring flow. Um, yeah. so, so uh, especially the, in rivers, yeah. Yeah, so okay. the, I mean, the, to, to measure flow, you, you can put a current meter in the water, you, you can use acoustic devices to, to measure uh, currents. Um, we were using this optical approach where you're looking at um, the, uh, if you've got a series of images of the sea surface uh, or of an underwater flow, then you can look at the displacement uh, of small patches of that uh, between adjacent frames. Um, and it's a methodology which is applied, uh, it's called particle image velocimetry, where you break your whole field down to these small regions and then you look at the displacement over short periods of time, um, which is to do with the correlation um, between one step in time and then the next step in time. So you can work out from that over a particular time step how big the displacement is, and then you get the uh, velocity. So you get a map of the surface uh, velocity. Now, uh, that, that's an established technique, um, and it's used in the lab. It's used uh, underwater in the lab, and previously I used it in the, in the field. Um, using drones uh, is fairly new, so people have used it in rivers. Um, this is the first time it's been applied to in the sea, where there's more challenges because we've got waves, uh, which then vary the, the shape of the water surface. You have sun glint. It, it makes it more complicated, and there's more errors associated with it. So you just have to be careful in, in applying this kind of technique. Well, um, and in our case, which often what we have found in these river papers that use PIV techniques as well is um, they often had a static feature in the images as well, such as, you know, a bridge or something. And we were obviously just, um, we actually cut out CGEN, you know, the, the monopile structure from our 
drone footage, so we actually didn't have anything, you know, static in the frame as well. So again, another little challenge to um, make it, yeah. So what what that means is you can't I'll, I'll keep really, going. Oh, go. No, no, go, 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 please finish. You, know, you can't really measure the mean flow very accurately because the drone is also moving around. So you're measuring your movement relative to a moving surface. But what you can do really sure. well and what we did was you can subtract that mean movement and then look at the, the, the spatial variation in the flow, which is the, the eddies in the flow and the upwelling patches of water in the flow, so the divergence in, in the flow. So you can subtract out the drone movement and what you're then left with is the turbulence in the water. Fantastic. So keeping on the, the challenges, so how about uh, the, the challenging of detecting uh, then the, the, the seabirds uh, the, and uh, how to, to rebuild basically then, uh, then, then the track uh, to then be used uh, into, into the hidden macro model? Uh, yeah, that's um, quite challenging. It, it, it's quite hard describing what the situation was because a pitch just says a thousand words. But well, you can imagine if you're looking down on the sea surface, it's mostly dark, but then it's got bright patches, which might be bits of foam or it might be breaking waves on it. And then above that, you've got these white birds flying around and moving. So you're trying to follow automatically, hopefully, these pale birds as they fly quite rapidly over a surface that has also got bright things which are moving rapidly. So it's quite a challenge. Um, you can detect moving objects quite easily. Again, by looking at the difference between frames, you can detect movement quite easily. Um, but then the next step is figuring out, well, that thing that's moving, is it a wave? Is it a patch of foam? Or is it a bird? And that's where we use the machine learning to basically um, uh, identify which which were the birds and so we we trained up a uh, it's called a bag of words approach it's a way of describing shapes uh, in a machine learning uh, sense we trained one up and then it was um, pretty successful at telling the difference between a bird or a patch of foam um, with an accuracy of about 90 percent um, and then we were then tracking these moving objects but putting in that condition that you only track the birds. And so we then linked up the tracks by just following what were identified as birds. And it, it didn't get it right all the time. And so there was, after yeah. we automatically done the tracking, uh, there was quite a significant amount of kind of that tidying up of the, uh, the data afterwards. Yeah, and, and that was literally us going through um, tracks and uh, what we had, maybe um, we tracked a bird for a while and then all of a sudden it might have passed um, some turbulent or, you know, foam bit and then maybe got lost for, you know, a few frames and then we found it again. So then we could actually stitch these tracks back together because we didn't want to lose the really nice long tracks. So um, there was that sort of manual, um, yeah, post-processing involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so you got, uh, you got your tracks and then uh, um, you uh, basically asked, uh, um, with the, using the hidden Marco model framework, you asked what is basically, you first classified uh, two general behaviors from your tracks and then you asked the questions how basically the, the movements and the different behaviors are related to the, uh, to the, physical, uh, uh, to the physical features. And so you actually, um, um, I'll get a little bit. Uh, I'll get a bit, a bit, a little bit later on the on the on the either macro model side, but on the on the biology on the biology side. So on the on the meaning basically of this interaction with uh, uh, between your uh, your uh, your type of the, the type of movements and these boils that are actually uh, that are, they actually appear and uh, and and disappear. So you, you found basically that the animal is actually uh, looking at, like sort of, uh, is using visual cues. So the animal is looking at the, at the, at the boys and at some point it makes the decision to actually follow these uh, uh, erupting uh, boys. Am I correct, Lillian? Is, uh, is yeah, correct? so, I mean, that was something we actually didn't know, you know, how much they yeah. actually, um, how really bright vision works. I've been reading up a lot of papers and talked to a lot of people while I was, yeah. you know, um, you know uh, looking at all the data and things and and one one thing we didn't know as well is um should we just extract the features right underneath the turns or should we yeah. extract them slightly ahead of them 
drinking. And that's wine. where all, um, yeah, <laughs> lots of um, uh, switch yeah. channels. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and that's where we then started um, looking at, uh, well, maybe, yeah, extracting them, you know, at various varying sort of distances um, ahead of the turn, sort of from its trajectory, from its trajectory um, ahead of the turn's side. So, um, yes. Um, no one could really tell me how, how, how they would actually look down to the surface or if they would always look straight ahead. And obviously um, there's a difference between their binocular vision and their then sort of when they're actually above a target, they actually just use, um, and they might uh, tilt the head and whatnot. So there was all these sort of yeah. biological questions that weren't actually answered yet anyways. So, um, yeah. Uh, I I'll ask my last question and then I'll leave it to Grant and to the people that want to ask uh, uh, questions. So this is about the, uh, the hidden macro model. So um, in, your, in your discussion, and of course, uh, I mean, you discuss the, uh, the, the disadvantages, well, not the disadvantages, I mean, the drawbacks of the, um, um, of the, of, of the framework. Uh, for example, I mean, you, uh, it is of course very true that uh, you, you characterized general, uh, general behaviors and what you characterize is a, is a simplification of the flight process that you that is basically a circuit that is, that is uh, um, nice and, and fine. I, I was wondering if you uh, have tried, uh, two questions actually, so if you have tried with more than uh, two states, two behavioral states, um, and uh, what actually were uh, um, the, uh, the challenges in working with uh, such a high resolution, uh, si such high resolution data set in terms of retaining any, uh, the, the information, but uh, um, then actually um, having uh, um, uh, 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 like the, 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 the We've lost her. <laughs> oh no! I think, <laughs> you, yeah, you might need to repeat that question there, Mariana. Oh, you sorry. sort of turn into a robot for a second. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> France doesn't have a very good internet, or this part of part of France doesn't. So I was saying, if you tried with more than two states, and what are basically the challenging in working with uh, such a high resolution data set? Roland, yeah, I guess I should answer <laughs> that. So, I mean, in terms of the two states, that is a rather crude simplification of what we actually see. I mean, especially compared to other HMM based studies. So, sometimes, especially with birds, actually, when we use HMMs, you have very clearly separated states. Like now the animal is resting mm -hmm. on the ground, now maybe it's walking, and now it's flying. And you very clearly see this in like the empirical distribution in the histogram. And then you fit your HMM with three or four states, and everything is very clear. It's crystal clear. The states are nicely separated. Now, in this case, these birds are just flying all the time. And even just by looking at the videos, I mean, sometimes you will see them dive down and go to the mm -hmm. surface. So you see there's something happening there. There's some um, foraging event taking place, but oftentimes it's not so clear. They're making very sharp bends and slowing down apparently, but it's not immediately clear if this is still flying around or if there's something happening in terms of a foraging event. That's my perspective anyway. So even just looking at the videos, it's not always clear what they're doing. And that's exactly then also what we found uh, with the model is that Sure, when we fit a two-state HMM, we have a fairly nice separation into two states, which we could, to some extent, make sense of, like which could be interpreted, could be interpreted, um, and 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 then matching these states, the decoded states by the model with the videos, everything made sense. Uh, but it's it is it is certainly a simplification. Now the thing is, since they are moving continuously, flying all the time. We did try three states initially, but that made interpretation much harder, actually. Um, and conceptually, when you think about it, when you look at the videos, and Lillian and Alex produced this nice video, I don't know if you saw that. Yes. Um, I mean, you see them flying straight, and then there's a bend, and then there's a sharper bend, and they're going down. It's sort of like, it, in terms of what they're doing, what maneuver they're currently <laughs> exhibiting, it's much more continuous than what we could describe using two states or three states. So it, it, it is certainly a fairly crude simplification of what's going on. But the moment you go to more than two states, things become very difficult to interpret. 
And that's, diff that's problematic because we wanted to relate at least crude proxies of behaviors to these covariates, like to the surface features. And then when you have three or four states, which might fit the data better, but which are hard to interpret, then it's very, very difficult to make sense of these interactions of the states with the covariates. So that's sort of like probably a very unsatisfactory answer to the first question. But that, as you know, as somebody who has been working with HMEMS, that's always the case. It's like unsupervised learning. It's, it's, like, it's like a cluster analysis. You partition your data, your time series into different states, and then you try to make sense of the states. And sometimes that works very well. If you have the situation like a bird resting versus a bird flying, then it works perfectly fine. But if the bird is just flying all the time, and then sometimes it's flying fast, sometimes not so fast, it's not as clear, obviously. And then the challenges um, you mentioned, I think you said it already, the high resolution is obviously the key challenge here. Um, I mean, it's kind of weird, like 10 years ago, we had hourly data or sometimes eight data points per day. And we were like, oh, this is very exciting. We have eight observations per day, we can infer the behavior. Um, that was easier to model, but uh, so, but we always knew that kind of we couldn't really infer the behaviors if we have one observation every three hours, because within three hours, so much can happen. Now we have the opposite case. We have this very, very high resolution data. And in principle, there's all information we could ever want it to have in, the, in those high resolution data. But now the modeling is very difficult because you have the very, very high correlation over time <laughs> in the data. So in movement modeling, what we do with HMMs, we usually model the steps and the turns. So the turning angles, not the turns, not the birds, the turning <laughs> angles. Um, and now in this case, when you look at the turning angles, most of them are just zero because we have so such high resolution data. Uh, uh, so what was the original resolution was 30 hertz? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 30 hertz, yeah, so 30 observations per second. So that means you have lots of turning angles which are exactly equal to zero. And just statistically, that's a problem actually because you have this inflation of zeros and the model doesn't like that at all because you're now fitting a continuous distribution where actually 50% of the data are just zeros. Uh, the model doesn't like that. So we ended up with this other measure there, the tortuosity, which worked much better in terms of the modeling because we didn't have these statistical artifacts. So the high resolution is a problem. Uh, it makes modeling harder because the correlation patterns over time are very much stronger. And when you do like standard model checks for this HMM, um, the model doesn't look very good because we, we obviously, two states are not sufficient and we don't capture, we don't fully capture the zero correlation. But as we argue in the paper, it's, it's not so much of a problem because we just wanna roughly infer what the animal is doing at what point of time and how this relates to the environment and, and not fully capturing the correlation structure uh, is, I'm pretty sure it's not that problematic. We have some sensitivity checks in the paper, which indicate that it's not that much of a deal, of a problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so first, first of all, thank you, thank you for saying these things. I think that uh, all, all of us, uh, uh, people anyway, in general, working, uh, trying to work with uh, with the hidden macro models, uh, need to hear these uh, the, these <laughs> things and all the checks and things to 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 to, to go through. And uh, yeah, um, just uh, saying about like the the the, the autocorrelation. I mean, this is also, I guess, is something that. Uh, um, we like statisticians needs to um, start to deal in the future. I mean, we are collecting more and more high resolution data, so this this will be a problem that uh, uh, people will uh, will encounter more and more often. So I guess people will talk more about uh, about this as well. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting how the how this field, the statistic ecology, how it's going to develop and how it's going to tackle this problem, how it's going to deal with that, with this very high resolution. I mean, when you think of accelerometer data, you, ha you always have this very high resolution. And I mean, many people are just using like decision trees to classify behavior, which completely ignore any correlation. HMMs at least acknowledge the correlation, but not to the extent that you find it in the data. So I don't know what, what this is going, how the field is going to do with that these statistical challenges. Oftentimes it will not matter that much depending on the study aim, but I don't know interesting times to be in this field as a quantitative person <laughs> absolutely I, I have no idea how this is going to evolve <laughs> <laughs> hopefully we will see we will see something um okay i'll, I'll leave it i'll give it to to grant so um and if people have any um uh, any questions did I become a robot again? Oh, yeah, I you became a robot again, just a little bit. 
It's okay. Don't worry about it. We got it covered, Mariana. You're all right. We've actually got a few questions that have come in in the chat, so I'll I'll approach I'll um I'll deal with those um just on the because we're getting uh, we're getting a bit short on time. So the first question comes from Adrian Gall, who asked, "How would this approach work with dark birds?" And she's just turned her camera on, and I assume it's morning in Alaska, so she's probably got a big coffee in her hands. Uh, shall I pick that one up? Um... So I, the, the way we track the birds is we look for movement. Um, so, and it's more about are the objects moving as the first step in the analysis. So you're looking for things moving um, and then you apply a size threshold. So you can pick out objects which are about the right size, which are moving before you then go on and say, is it a, a bird shaped thing uh, that's moving? So the, the first few steps of that, I mean, it's um, you're, you're looking for something which is distinct from the background. Uh, so a very dark bird on a very dark background would be very hard to see that it's moving. Um, we, Have you tried at all with, with darker species or is that why you focused on gulls? Um, I, the, the terms were what was there. Um, we have tried to observe other species using drones and it's more of a challenge. So um, wow. uh, guillemots, black guillemots on dark water are harder to spot um, and you would then want better resolution. So you want the drone lower, but then you would worry about that impacting on the behavior of the birds, which looks like one of the yeah. next questions coming up. <laughs> like, like a flying tiesty is okay, um, but actually a tiesty just drifting, you know, with a current sitting on the water, that's definitely at a hundred meters that, which we were flying at, that becomes more difficult. So. Thanks. Right, wonderful. And you're right, Alex, the next question is from Tony Diamond, who's asked, did the turns react to the drones at all? And we're seeing some shaking hands from Lillian here. Yeah, I mean, in short, no. I mean, we were flying yeah, at 100 meter and um, there's no reactions going on at that. Height. Yeah, that's, um, that, that's quite high. I mean, I, some of the, there was a paper recently by Jeff Hinkey um, from NOAA looking at penguins and they were like 50 meters or something like that, 30 meters above the birds before they even looked up. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, the the turns were obviously busy, uh, busy doing their thing. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah. Um, and then also we had um, the the phantom drone, Alex, right? Um, the white drone. So again, that doesn't look as um, you know, like a bird of prey or anything. It's yeah, not I mean, a dark, we, aggressive drone. <laughs> we used a couple of different drones, and we we yeah. found a dark, um, more angular shaped drone did. Um, get more of a response. It was particularly when we were coming in to land or taking off from, from the shore, yeah. uh, there were oyster catchers that were getting upset. Uh, we were obviously closer to where they were sort of on, on the shore and they responded much more strongly to the other drone that we, we did try, which is one of the reasons which we didn't actually use that, was sticking with a, a lighter colored, more friendly looking drone seemed to uh, elicit yeah. much uh, weaker response from, from things. You almost need to dress it up like another bird, like another doll. <laughs> yeah. uh, David Hirenbach has a question. He asks, did you notice birds responding to other birds' sweeps uh, and converging on feeding birds? So were there sort of aggregations forming within the, uh, the turbulence zone? Uh, a couple of times. I mean, I, I, it was one of the challenges in the tracking was actually where uh, the... the um, the way that the, the system was tracking individual ob targets. Um, it, it, if you have two birds together and then chasing each other and then moving apart, then it's quite hard for that to be done automatically. So some of the cleaning up of the tracks that we were doing had to deal with birds in sort of uh, close together. Yeah, crossing and each other sort of thing, yeah. And then there were definitely instances where one, one bird seemed to attract other birds to it, one or two other birds to it. And then that gave us problems in terms of the, the tracking. Um, so I, yeah, short answer, yes, there were, were instances of that happening. But yeah, I mean, if you're interested in price seeding and all these things, I mean, it's a perfect method to look into that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay, we've got another question from Pam Loring, who's asked, could this approach be used to assess turn movements around offshore wind turbines? Uh, yes. Yes. 
<laughs> Good. Nice, <laughs> nice short answer. I like those. <laughs> yeah. I'd say yes. I mean, obviously, wind turbines get so tall these days, you know, mm -hmm. uh, over 100 meters over the water and whatnot. And it depends how you can fly around them and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. You, you yeah. Can, and I guess the big challenge of wind turbines would be to make sure that your your drone doesn't actually strike the turbine when it's spitting. I also the I mean it it depends on the question that you're asking. So we we were asking the question how do the birds relate to the features on the surface? Uh, so we were looking at how they were foraging in the the the, the wake uh, of the the device. Um, and so we were then assuming that the birds, even though they're flying a short way above the surface, were kind of in that same geometry. Um, if you're interested in birds interacting with blades of turbines, and then you've got a big offset between the height of the drone and where the bird is in relation to whatever fixed plane you're dealing with, then, then you've got more of the issues of the, the sort of three-dimensional geometry to be dealing with. Um, so. If you're interested in birds foraging at the surface of the wake, in, as in our application, then yes. If you're interested in birds impacting on blades, you've got to think about 3D geometry. You'd have to do something fancy with stereo vision, and that's something that we're just attempting. Um, we have tried a little bit, like two drones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you use multiple drones to look and track birds in 3D rather than we're doing a 2D projection onto the yeah. surface? Yeah, that'd be quite that'd be quite interesting stuff. All right. Well, I think we're cutting close to a bit over time here, but that's all right. We'll move on to the next paper. Thank you, Lillian, Alex, Thank you. and Roland for joining us. Fantastic paper. Yeah. And if you get a chance, if you're on Twitter and you get a chance to look at Lillian's uh, their their video that they did around this, it is super cool. It's very slick. Some very nice animations. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Um, and we will move on to the next paper. And we've got Juan Serratoza, who is joining us today. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself, my friend. Um, and I think we go, oh, Dave, and of course, David Hirenbach is here with us. Nice to see you, David. Um, get you both, uh, here we go. Nice to see you. And thank you for joining us, David. I know it's got to be really early in the morning for you, isn't it? Yeah, it is early, but I'm fully caffeinated, so it works. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very much for joining us. Very brave of you to wake up early to, uh, to hop on here today. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start off with this wonderful paper. So quantifying the at-sea distribution of seabirds has become a commonplace yet vitally important activity for conservation. It helps us not only to assess where birds occur, but also helps to identify the environmental drivers of their distribution, which really gives us an insight into their ecology. So a typical species distribution model, if you want to call it that, is done by uh, taking a data set of known locations of a species and associating those locations with some underlying environmental data. So this could be things like sea surface temperature, bathymetry, chlorophyll A, or other measurable environmental covariates that can be mapped spatially. Once this is done, a multivariate statistical algorithm can be applied that quantifies the relationship between those occurrences and the environmental variables. Now, this relationship can, can then be used to, say, predict the distribution of species in space and time, or to make assessments on, say, the environmental factors that drive distribution. Now, this process works because seabirds as top predators will respond to environment, environmental or oceanographic changes that affect those lower trophic level prey items. Now, these kinds of species distribution models are often applied to a single species at a time. In some cases, individual models are run on several different species, which can, you can generate a series of maps that kind of can be overlain to help generate potential marine protected areas or to identify hotspots. However, for those of us who've spent time in the field, and uh, certainly at sea, will have seen these large multi-species flocks, which suggests that some assemblages coexist in space and time due to similar environmental requirements. So the question that's only somewhat explored in the literature is what are the environmental mechanisms that drive species assemblages? So today we're joined by Juan Saratoza and D David Hirenbach. The lead author of this paper is Juan, who aimed to answer the question for species assemblages in the Southeast Pacific. Uh, more specifically, this area um, is uh, the west coast of South America, heading all the way towards um, Easter Island. So it's quite a quite a large area and an area where we don't know a lot uh, a lot about uh, species distributions. 
Um, so this area, as I said, this is about a 3,500 meter, a 3,500 kilometer uh, strip, uh, strip of ocean. Um, and this oceanic zone is characterized by the strong gradients of environmental conditions. So on the East Coast, you've got the Humboldt Current, uh, which is highly productive. And on the west side, you've got this sort of like lower productivity area uh, around, say, Easter Island. Now, interestingly, in the middle of this study area, you've got these two big archipelagos um, that uh, have this uh, sort of like localized primary productivity, high, higher levels of localized primary productivity is driven by this island mass effect. Um, and this has implications on the local ecology. Um, so in this paper, occurrences of seabirds were recorded from 11 opportunistic ship cruises uh, that were held in the study area between 2014 and 2017 using standard trips, strip transect methods. The authors chose to focus on birds that bred in the Southeast Pacific and specifically those that bred on islands within the study area. For birds that were unable to be identified to species, they were placed in nine taxonomic groupings. The authors also took care to deal with sampling heterogeneity coming from the fact that surveys were opportunistic. Um, to do the modeling, the authors used a set of 10 environmental variables uh, with the dynamic variables being used to derive, say, seasonal composites. Um, and a multivariate generalized linear model approach was taken using AIC for model selection, AKEK's information criterion. Um, to characterize the seabird assemblages for modeling, the authors used a clustering method to identify these discrete clusters. Over the surveys, the, most three, the three most common species were Juan Fernandez petrel, Massatiera petrel, and sooty shearwater. However, nearly 6,700 individuals were recorded from 26 species in the nine taxonomic groups. The cluster analysis identified four distinct groups, which had exhibited some really clear spatial patterns. And I wanted to pop up the figure from this paper, which I'm sure that I loaded up here ahead of time because I'm clever like that sometimes, once in a blue moon, I share my screen. Um, it's one of these screens here. There we go. I hope that you can all see this. Um, and if no, you, no, nope. not yet. Yeah, yeah. How about now? Can you see it now? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So if you can see here, um, you can see the uh, clusters are defined by these different shapes and colors. You can see these red, this red <laughs> cluster here. These are birds that are associated with the Humboldt current, uh, very coastal species. And you've got these more oceanic species here, the uh, green and blue, the green and blue species, we'll call them. But these seem to be mostly associated with these, um, um, Archipelagos, the uh, Desventuradas Islands. So that's my uh, that's my uh, terrible Spanish accent there, and the Juan Fernandez Islands. And then out west towards Easter Island, you've got another group um, out here. So um, the GLM really highlighted that uh, the day of the year, so Julian Day. Uh, bathymetry, chlorophyll A, sea surface temperature, and sea surface salinity were the most important covariates in the model. So thank you very much again, Juan and David, for joining us today. Um, the first question I have to ask, actually, is more of a human question. It's not so much focused on the science. I'm just wondering. So this, the, the paper said that you did these surveys on Chilean Navy vessels, and I was really wondering, like, what is it like to be on a Chilean Navy vessel? Is it, I mean, and, and what kind of other science is going on around around you while you're on the vessel? I mean, did you have trouble kind of coordinating your, your seabird transects with the other things that were going on on board? Yeah. Okay. Th thanks a lot for, for the invitation. It, it's very uh, funny that you mix these two papers because our methodology was like the basic way of doing seabird ecology, just getting into a ship with your binoculars, looking into the, the birds. And then the other people with these super fancy new technologies uh, and man, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. Most of the of the ships, uh, that the vessels that we were on board were uh, from the Armada de Chile, which they they go normally to Easter Island and Juan Fernandez uh, a lot uh, just for provisioning of, of the islands because they're so hard that they. They, they go and they go on patrol also to, uh, to see if there is a, a illegal fishing vessels or things like that. So yeah, there was no other science on board. We were the only ones doing something. And it was really, oh. really funny because they, they were like, what, what are you doing here? What are you looking at? 
you know, it's the <laughs> ocean, you're there looking for hours and you see just a couple of birds. <laughs> But actually it was very interesting because uh, that collaboration meant uh, that they got kind of very interested in, in the science that we were doing. And actually they asked for some protocols and we did some presentations for, for the, the Marines. So at the end it was kind of nice collaboration. And the other thing is, is, is that these vessels, they stop at uh, Motumotiro Hilo, which is uh, a silver colony, Salas Gomez. Uh, and so this is a super isolated small islet, rock islet is just half hectare, but there is a big colony of birds there. And it's like the, the summit of one of these uh, sea mounts. So we always went with, a, uh, with people, oceanographists and some uh, scuba divers and with some of the teams to try to do some more sampling in this uh, small islet because of with the marine, we could get to this place. Yeah. So normally, even if some of these were just uh, cyber biologists, in some of these trips, we were just a group of, of people working on uh, ecology, like marine biology. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, and yeah. and I, I assume that while you were on board, you must, based on that, I mean, they, yes, they must have been very uh, amenable to having you on board and they, uh, it seems like it was a very positive experience, eh? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Like it, at, at the as I said at the beginning, they were just, "What, what are you doing?" Like, yeah. <laughs> looking into the ocean. <laughs> but then, little by little, and then you get there, like in amazing species, like the wandering albatrosses. Yeah. Appear, and then you 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 get someone to see it, and they are like, "Wow, this is fantastic!" And actually, I, I think some of the people got interested in seabirds thanks to us. You're, you're inspiring the marines to become birders this is true like in a way they were like it's, it's funny this feeling that they spend hours days at, at sea but actually sometimes they don't pay that much attention to yeah. what they have around them that's interesting yeah that, cool so okay so into the science a little bit uh, my first question is about um the, the sort of the next step for you guys. Um, have you guys considered doing some say predictive modeling and looking at say, um, looking at how these species assemblages might change um, in time? Yeah, that would be like the next step, but actually I got a job in, in England. So now I'm working for bird life and I don't have time. <laughs> well, welcome to the UK. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, but yeah, there is a, a lot of data in those in that in that data set that we could use for for doing some modeling exercise especially now as you said that you can do some sdm of stack stacking the the like ssdm this package that is out mm -hmm. it's kind of new so you, you could do some like uh, modeling like tag, tagging all the species and, and yeah, that would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Dave, but, Dave, so David, far, what do you think? Is, is, that a, uh, is that something for a PhD student, David? Yeah, I think it would be really fabulous. You know, the, there's, there's a lot of data, especially for some of the breeding birds during the breeding season. Juan has tons and tons of data. So yeah, I think there could be some really nice, nice models. Could yeah, be done, for sure. Um, Guillermo Luna, which is my, he was my PhD, he was my, my tutor, my tutor, yeah, <laughs> and he has been the one that has been, his lab is the one from Chile, is the one that has been more uh, building up this, this data set, so yeah. yeah, and actually we have been recording also uh, marine debris during the, the trips, we were recording also marine debris, so Right. And they, they are trying to, to get Thank some anyways. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot of really cool sea mounts too, right? I mean, there's a whole chain of sea mounts around Juan Fernandez Islands that I think smaller scale yeah. modeling work could be done with your data. That'd be cool. 
Yeah. And actually, so that was, that kind of leads me very nicely into another question I had, which is sort of about, uh, about these seamounts. Obviously you've got, what's really quite interesting here is you've, you've obviously covered quite a wide environmental um, gradient here, you know, you've, and as you said in the paper, these gradients are something on like three orders of magnitude in, in difference in some cases, which is quite spectacular. Um, so when you get to the seamounts, which are obviously way out in the middle of nowhere, are you seeing this really massive increase in biodiversity? Um, over those seamounts, um, and is that related to say the dish where these um, archipelagos um, exist? The thing is, our data is, is very coarse. Like mm -hmm. we couldn't really tell that much because we have to to like to put together the data and make it as a day as a, the sampling unit. So. We couldn't do that. We couldn't see that pattern that much as you would expect in this. Uh, the only one that is super obvious is a uh, salazigomet because it's a column. It's, a, it's like the, the the top of the seamount, and then you can see it there. But I think you will need like a high resolution study to 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 see that pattern or or look into the data in another way uh, to, to find that pattern. Maybe even in Juan Fernandez. Or, uh, right. I don't know. What do you think, David? Yeah, I think the big challenge was the really low bird densities that Juan found. I mean, it was less than a bird an hour, right? I mean, there was very little birds in the offshore areas. Yeah. So the transects have to be big enough to encompass enough birds to describe the community. So the daytime pieces were a nice compromise. Uh, but sometimes there was very few birds even on a full day of transiting. Wow. Mm -hmm. But I think if you didn't single species, maybe you could cut the data finer, you know, um, mm -hmm. for some of the abundant birds. I don't know. And, and actually it would be a thing because with seamounts, actually there is not that many literature that is actually, uh, it's one of these uh, things that we all no, the seamounts are as a high center of diversity and everything, but actually there's not that much publications that are showing that. So it's a, a really interesting uh, work that should be done in the future. Mm. Mm. That's very cool. All mm. right, I'll, I'll ask one more question before I hand it off to Mariana for some questions. And uh, my question is about say, climate change moving forward. So if we're looking at, you know, ocean temperature rises, we're looking at ocean regime shifts, shifts. do you think, uh, based on what you're seeing out there now, do you think that these species assemblages are going to change very drastically over time? Is this something that uh, we're going to see species moving into, uh, into different areas? I mean, that I think they're going to follow the, the groups like we have seen them like in smaller scale, like foraging dynamics following these uh, climate changes. But I think they're gonna follow these tracks. If the Humboldt current uh, narrows, then the species that are dependent of the Humboldt current, they're gonna move into that narrow area. I think they're gonna follow the patterns of the of the water masses in these like big scales, of course. That's that's what I think. Yeah. I don't know that either. I really agree. I, th I bet, you know, like compression of the upwelling system, mm. oceanic waters impinging on the shelf more. Uh, and then I guess if the populations on the islands change over time, the halos may become smaller if there's fewer birds maybe, right? So you will not see those big halos. Those are some, maybe some predictions. Great, right. thank you very much. Mariana, do you have any questions? Um, I think we've got a couple of questions down in the chat as well, or at least one question I see down there. So go for it. I'll, I'll go for uh, for one question then, then I'll leave it to, to, to people asking other questions. So um, I'm wondering about uh, um, what this means for, for the conservation basically of these uh, species and for the uh, for the designation basically of uh, marine protected areas and uh, mm -hmm. how you are going to what well, even if now you're working for bird life international uh, <laughs> if you're going to to, to move forward um, and uh, keep collecting uh, collecting data yeah uh, 
actually right now i think there is no more collection of data but we're still working like uh, the university universidad catolica del norte from chile they have a project in easter island uh, and juan fernandez and desventuradas so they're gonna still work in it uh, they're gonna still work in in the area but right now there's no more transects or there's no mm. more information we're not getting more information in, in that sense but what, what is interesting from the conservation point of view is that our paper shows that even if the seabird assemblages from Desventuradas and Juan Fernandez are very different in a way. When you see that pattern in the seabird distribution at sea, that is not that clear. So actually, if you make a marine protected area in Desventuradas or if you make one in Juan Fernandez, you're gonna be affecting both communities mm -hmm. because we see that the pattern in the distribution at sea, Juan Fernandez, Petrel, they're all over the place. So, if you want to protect that species, you can't just have a, a protected area around their confidence archipelago because they're going to be going uh, somewhere else, like in the Venturas. But yet, right now, there is no, there's no more data collection, like seabirds at sea distribution. Yeah, yeah. But you, you, you said you were establishing, oh, we have got questions. Okay, we got questions from uh, from uh, from the audience. Mm -hmm. We sure uh, do. We, do you want to yeah. go, you want to do it in Mariana? No, you go, you go. <laughs> I'm shy with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Andy Nichols who says, in terms of your confidence intervals, how, how did they vary depending on the amount of environmental variables used? Uh, that, I, <laughs> might, might be a bit of a technical <laughs> question so you, you can you can probably be be a bit wishy-washy on this one because uh like i said we we want to try and avoid too much in the technical questions here but uh, yeah if you've got a, a simple answer you can throw at andy that would be helpful uh, the, the amount of the amount of environmental variables used for the country how did you depend on the amount of environmental Okay, we, we, we followed like uh, which the environmental variables were more, they had more biological uh, meaning for the species based on uh, published literature. And I don't know, like from a statistic point of view, I think if you, we were measuring correlation of the variables to see if we were not including variables that were, were very highly correlated. Um, yeah, trying to get rid of those correlations in between the variables, and I don't know how that affects the confidence intervals. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, thanks for that. No, that's uh, that's fine, um, Andy. If you have I some mean, more, you are more of an esthetician than me. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, if you've got some, if you want to, to follow up, please uh, please do feel free to uh, yeah follow up with them. I guess if they're okay with that. Um, I've got a question from Adrian Gall in here, and that is, what is the significance of the Julian date? Does it indicate variation because of breeding season, seasonal variation in occurrence of oceanic features, or is it an artifact of when the sampling occurred? Mm, we, the, I think it was mostly related to there is a big stationality in the area, particularly for Juan Fernandez petrol, Stegner's petrol. Uh, and pink food shear water. So, and those three are very important uh, birds in the, with big numbers. So, and, and they go to breed in the archipelagos and they move away from the archipelago. So I think it was, it was related to, to the seasonality of the breeding season in, in part of the area. Hmm. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions from the audience. Please do raise your hand. We've got a couple more minutes for another question or two. Um, I don't see anything. So I will ask another question, which is um, about the uh, trophic levels at which these different groups are feeding. So you've got these different groups, um, these four different groups. The question I've got is, are those four different groups feeding on specific uh, trophic levels within each, like are the birds in the Humboldt current, are they feeding mostly on squid? Um, are the birds near Easter Island feeding mostly on, I don't know, say surface amph amphipods or copepods? Um, yeah. Do you have any indication of that? Yeah, 
the diets are very different, particularly in relation to the Humboldt curve, because it is mostly based on uh, sardines. No, how, how do you call it in English? Yeah, sardines. 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 Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's the anchoveta, which is called in, Chile, in Chilean, is like the base uh, diet of Humboldt current penguins, uh, the Peruvian booby, like several species that rely a lot in, in, in schooling fish. So there is a big, for the Humboldt current, there's a big distinction there. And then uh, as you move into the more, or as you move farther uh, west, east, no, west, sorry, then there is more of a mix of different uh, tropic levels and different diets, like more based on fine fish or more based on, on sea, on, 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 uh, I you Quick. Squids. Yes, <laughs> calamares. Calamares. Squids. Love calamares. 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 Te vas a un yes. yes. Bocadillo de calamares. Ooh, okay, that's sorry. even better. That's even better. Now I'm only talking about wind farms and solar development. So <laughs> I'm losing Then you, my... you need to talk to Grant. Yeah, actually, it was super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> very oh, good yeah. yeah all right well we're at 1800 and the here in the uk so i think it's time we uh call it quits now before i close off uh so thank you juan thank you thank david you. for joining us today fantastic work thank as you. um you know as uh, as you guys tend to do as a seabird community all of your work is always amazing and i love getting a chance to talk to you guys about this sort of stuff. Um, just a quick few things. One is um, here at Seabird Sessions, we're always looking for new exciting papers. We're always looking for some guest hosts who wanna come on and present a paper. If you're keen to be a guest host, please do drop us an email or a message on Twitter. You can um, actually, what I'll do is I will put my email down in the chat right now. Um, something like this. Yeah, I gotta. There we go. So that's my email for anyone who wants to, to uh, um, join in as a guest host. Please do drop me an email, or you can find us on Twitter, uh, and our Twitter it, Twitter handle is at Seabird Sessions. Very easy to find, um, or you can drop an email back to the uh, to listserv group. Is it black uh, box or black box? Black? No, no, black box. Black box. It's actually is an interesting story behind that, which I'll 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 tell you I'll tell you after we turn off the after we stop recording. Um, anyways, yeah. So um, yep, yeah, please do uh, email us if you're interested in being a guest host. Also, keep your eyes out for sixty seconds Seabird Science, which is on Twitter. Um, if you've got a paper, it doesn't matter if it's recent or something you've done before, and you want to do a sixty second video. Um, to put up on the web. It's a, it's a very cool little format. You'd give your, you summarize your paper in 60 seconds. It's followed by a lovely introduction from myself, usually wearing hashtag Grant's hat and uh, a little bit of music with a video from, uh, from Ellie Owen with some puffins bouncing around in the front. It's pretty slick. Um, and I'd love to see some more, uh, some more videos. Um, I think that's it. Uh, I don't have anything else. So it was very lovely to see you all today. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we will see you all next week. I'm going to stop recording now and we can all take a deep breath.